um, being webcast uh, online, and the recording will be available uh, in about five days. Um, so welcome to the first Delta Plant Interagency Implementation Committee meeting of the year 2020, uh, the 14th DPIC meeting overall in its history. I'm Susan Tatayan, Chair of the Delta Stewardship Council, and I also serve as Chair of the DPIC Self Plan Interagency Implementation Committee. Uh, and I'm honored to call this meeting to order. Uh, a brief reminder, and quickly for those of you who have not tuned in to a DPIC meeting before, the Delta Reform Act of 2009 requires the council, the Delta Stewardship Council, to establish and oversee a committee of agencies responsible for implementing the Delta Plan. Uh, DPIC first met in April 2014. Since then, it has served and will continue to serve an important role in strengthening collaboration and partnership among federal, state, and local agencies on priority actions affecting the Delta. DPIC is one of the few forums for generating public dialogue about opportunities to harmonize interagency actions in the Delta watershed. This forum brings together high-ranking leaders of federal, state, and local agencies to guide and coordinate progress toward achieving the quality goal. It is a forum meant to showcase DPIC agency successes and to drive actions to address pressing issues affecting the Delta. It's also an opportunity to show that top officials can work together effectively and achieve long-term benefits for the second and the Delta. So let's start with introduction, starting with uh, Mark Cowan at the Corps of Engineers on my right. Good afternoon. Mark Cowan, uh, Deputy Plenty Chief, Army Corps of Engineers. I'm sitting in for Alicia Kirshner, who's a little under the weather today. I'm Mike Scott, the U.S. Geological Service. Amber Ingram, Delta Conservancy. Mermaid Ray, no fisheries. Sharon Boss, Louisiana. Ernest Gornat, Reclamation. Wade Crook with California Natural Resources Agency, Walking Act Developed State Water Resources Control Board. Arlene with Department of Water Resources. Kristen Pierre, California Environmental Protection Agency, and I'm here on behalf of Secretary Jared Dickinson. Dan Casper, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, here on behalf of Paul Sue. Good afternoon, Oscar Diego, Seattle County Supervisor, here on behalf of the Office of Stewardship. Brian Thompson, U.S. Region 9, I'm filling in for Tremont Floyd, Carl Wilcox, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, for Jack Bond. And I'm John Calloway, the, the Delta Science for Research. So, if, if any DPIC members have a question or I might, just, I might just share uh, a couple things. There's obviously a lot happening in water right now, but one uh, item I would point out is uh, the Newsom administration's effort to establish a water resilience portfolio to guide our efforts um, in the executive branch and state government uh, on all things water uh, during this administration. So the governor issued an executive order back in April, directed many of our state agencies here around the, the table to come together and really identify what we as, a, as an administration should do by way of investment, program, policy, regulations to set California on a pathway towards water resilience. By that, we mean really being able to weather uh, droughts and floods and the changing climate as it relates to our water system and enable people and natural places to continue to thrive in the coming decades. So we started that process in earnest back in April. Uh, conducted a lot of public outreach, many thanks to those around the table, including the Count Delta Stewardship Council for helping us solicit uh, public input. We ultimately received several hundred uh, uh, letters of comment or comments made in person. Uh, that, uh, or that turned into a draft water resilience portfolio that we issued in early, early January, requested uh, more comments, received about uh, 200 plus. Uh, Nancy Vogel sitting in the front row 
uh, has spent a lot of her life in the last year uh, coordinating this interagency effort, and we're really thankful for that. Uh, and now we're at the point of essentially uh, uh, reviewing the, the feedback we received from the draft resilience portfolio, and then we're going to be in the, hopefully in the position to issue a final water resilience portfolio in coming weeks. Uh, the goal there is it's really going to help us coordinate our efforts within state government around what we need to be doing to build water resilience and something that uh, others can transparently understand uh, to uh, guide their own work with the state. Thank you. Sure. Um, two updates from the Department of Water Resources. Um, we're working very intensely with our colleagues at the Department of Fish and Wildlife to complete um, an incidental take permit under California Endangered Species Act. It will be the first time the State Water Project has um, had an independent permit, if you will, under state law, um, which is really important to the department, um, part of which um, why it's important to me as a director is our ability to implement that permit in a transparent way, um, which is uh, important to the, uh, the bigger dialogue in the Delta. So I'm excited about that and excited about its uh, imminent uh, completion. Um, second news is um, the department is on the cusp of hiring a new division chief for multi-benefit projects, um, which is also very exciting. It's a new position for the department that will be responsible in bridging between our various um, flood responsibilities, state water project responsibilities to actually get a uh, good restoration projects in the ground. So that's an exciting step forward for uh, DWR. Okay, if there are no other updates, I just want to quickly note that um, the meeting summary from our November 4 meeting is uh, under tab 1. If you have any corrections to the summary, Please let Amanda all know. And uh, materials in the binders and on, also on the table near the entrance are the Delta Sur Japan Council's annual report, um, a memo regarding the Delta Plan performance measures that relate to agenda items for required in the binders. Uh, and I'm told to tell you about my latest blog. I'm eager to debate management. And with that, we'll move on to uh, Amanda Bowl and agenda uh, item two for the science funding government initiative update. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, um, I'm just here to provide a brief update on implementation of the Delta Science Funding and Governance Initiative priority actions that CPIC endorsed uh, last November. Okay. okay. Um, well, I'm going to forward a couple of slides, so if you're following along, you can look in your binder. Um, the first couple of slides that I have there are just background um, about kind of why we started the Science, Funding, and Governance Initiative about a year and a half ago. Um, and so I'm not going to jump into those in case there are any questions about that. But if you may recall, at the last um, CPIC member in no meeting in November, um, CPIC endorsed three priority action items to kind of start moving, moving these, these things along and to try and get us closer to finding and getting more funding for science in the Delta. So the first action, okay. So the first action had to do with, um, with um, doing a better job of tracking um, science funding in the Delta and just really getting a better sense of what we're spending our money on, what each agency is spending it on and how, how we're spending it and it just amounts. So with Reclamation as the lead, um, the funding template that um, the initiative suggested that we create to track this has been developed and we've shared it with all the DPIC agencies and I'm excited to report that um, most of the DPIC agencies have, have responded and provided their funding for the 18-19 fiscal year. Um, so Reclamation is currently crunching the numbers and developing an easy to understand report that we anticipate sharing with everyone at the next DPIC meeting in July. Um, at that point, we're also going to um, try and get a better understanding of kind of what happens during the first year of, of trying to collect this information um, and identify some lessons learned so we can make potentially just continue to make improvements in that process. And so um, uh, we will also be sending that survey out with um, that as well. Really going to them. So, um, we're also going to begin discussing how we're going to implement a critical review of science funding, which is kind of the second part of that first priority action um, item as well. And so you'll be hearing more about that in the coming months too. 
So the second priority action item that you all endorsed um, last November was um, to support the update to the science action agenda um, and to incorporate and to look more into uh, the development of management questions to go along with that as well. Um, so via the Delta Agency Science Support Group, we've already engaged staff from the sphere agencies in this process, begun the dialogue about what it would look like to start collecting management questions and what the update to the science action agenda should be. Um, so the Delta Science Program is working diligently on that, um, and there'll be a lot more information about, out about that in the coming months as well. Um, and I also want to note that, um, that uh, the update to the science action agenda is consistent with and supports Action 23.1 from the draft water resilience portfolio, which calls for the establishment of an interagency and public-private task force to prioritize key scientific questions. So we're excited that we can support that and hope to continue to work with resources agency and others on the development of that. And so finally, the, the, the third action um, that um, everyone endorsed last November was a science needs assessment workshop, which we're happy to announce that we are going to be holding at the end of April. That's April 27th and 28th. Uh, registration opens March 11th. Um, we're very excited about this workshop and the opportunity to dive into what it means to have a forward-looking science enterprise. We know that the climate is changing, and uh, which is leading to rapid global and local and irreversible environmental change. And so with this change as our lens, it's time to look beyond the current time horizon to a longer-term future with different science needs and opportunities. So this workshop is going to help us focus on developing a bold and forward-looking longer-term science strategy that will map a path and structure forward um, for base level science. Um, so during the workshop, we really are looking at this as, as a, a series of work sessions. Uh, we're going to be um, diving into several questions um, and collecting information from participants around, you know, what do we know about the future um, in terms of climate change? What, what will decision makers need to know in the future? What do we need to know to support the decisions that need to be made? What science needs to be done? Um, and then how do we get there? What kind of infrastructure do we need to have in place to um, provide um, the support to make all of that happen? So this workshop is for scientists and policymakers, and I encourage you to send your scientists and your managers and yourself if you can make it, at least to some of it. Um, we, need, we really need cross-representation and pollination in this workshop in order for it to be um, truly representative of kind of what everybody's needs are and needs are. Um, and we do anticipate taking what comes out of this workshop and bringing it back to DPIC in July. So that you'll be definitely hearing a lot more about this throughout this year. Um, in front of you is um, the school uh, we'll day-to-day flyer, um, and then also I want to uh, draw your attention to the advanced briefing paper for the workshop. Um, this will be online next week as well. We all have a copy of it here, and it really kind of um, lays out what we're trying to do at the workshop, provides some background information, things to get people thinking about prior to the workshop and during the workshop. Um, so um, I encourage you to take a look at this and to share this with your staff that you, you feel should attend this workshop. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Maybe, two, maybe a question yeah. in the comments. So a uh, question would be, we're obviously focused in this discussion on the, on, the, on the Delta, and so how do you define the Delta for the purposes of the workshop? I mean, we think about like, species like imperiled salmon, of course, they're depending on systems from the tributaries of the Sacramento and San Joaquin all the way out to the ocean. So how do you, how do you ensure that we're sort of engaged while we're coordinating science within the Delta engage more holistically across the, the broader uh, ecosystem? Yeah, so for this workshop, we are defining the Delta as the, the legal Delta and the Pursuit Marsh. So we are going including kind of what, what we work on at the Delta Research Council and what the Delta Independent Science Board also focuses on. Um, and I should mention that the Delta ISB is the other sponsor of this, of this workshop. Um, but yeah, that is something that we have throughout the, the length of, of the discussions of the Science Funding Governance Initiative and the, all the board group meetings that we've had for the last year and a half, and Mike can speak to this as well, that there, um, that has been a part, a big part of the discussion. It's like, because we know it's all connected. We know we need to be talking about this holistically. But for now, we're going to focus on the part that we can have a little bit more say in and, and focus on this. And you know, we've got a science program, we've got a science board that's sort of focused on the Delta. So we're going to we're going to do what we can right now. But it is part of a larger conversation that we need to be having. And it's one of the reasons why the Stewardship Council is part of the San Francisco Estuary Partnership um, as well. So I think yeah, those connections need to continue to be made. And this is our first first step. Got it. That's helpful. And the comment is. Several of us, actually, both in the state and federal agencies around the uh, dais here, over the last year, have been working toward these voluntary agreements, which are a potential pathway for implementation for this uh, Bay Delta Plan update that the Water Board has legally mandated uh, to pass. And part of what gets us, some of us, a lot of us, excited about this is this notion of um, 
a governance structure that would really utilize science to adaptively manage habitat and flow. Now, it remains to be seen, of course, whether the voluntary agreements come together, whether the water board would consider them as a pathway to implementation. But if all that does come to pass in the next you know, year or years, we should really consider how that governance uh, and science program within the voluntary agreement dovetails with all of this. Because what we would want to do is you know, generate a new silo uh, as you're trying to build cohesion through this effort. If I can, I would even say that we should even more specifically build the space and call out for the Delta Stewardship Council to continue to be a good convener for these discussions, a trusted body that all of our agencies that were gathered here, uh, obviously, that expresses, uh, can, can help can, uh, create the space. Uh, you know, as you well know, Wade, uh, the, the science is a space that can often be punted around politically, and it serves to be able to have a body where we continue to say what is an agreed upon status of what we're seeing. Um, do we continue to drive these discussions that better integrate not just an understanding of quantities of water, but activities at the landscape level? And it's, you know, as you all know, uh, it's not just about the Delta, but the Delta can be a place where, yes, for all of us uh, that we're uh, dealing in, but can be models for, there are models and watersheds throughout the state that can be uh, benefited. So I think that the spirit of the work, the nature of the work, is is not unlike, and again, the Delta being as complex as it is, a bit of a unique space here for all of us, but not unlike the work that's going on in the planet, down at the Fulton Sea, uh, places where watersheds are, are reacting to the impacts of state climate change and needing to be able to better synthesize how do you translate scientific understanding, command, and activity decisions, not just at the state agency level here for us, but at the local level where we know most water so, um, yeah, I really endorse the thought and idea that we need to not create another silo and ensure if volunteer agreements are to move forward, that it's that space and that spirit that's being created to utilize uh, regulatory or otherwise entities that are existing now to uh, kind of flesh that out and create that trust and, and build, build that work. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll quickly note that the Delta Science Program Yeah, I just invite us to ask the tough questions in this process, too, to really, you know, because it is a question of trust. And when we talk about uh, a more shared scientific uh, agenda, our agencies give up control, right? That's kind of, and that's, that's part of the, the challenge is the departments, et cetera. We have our different statutory authorities. We have our different reasons for doing our science. So I just think you all have set up a really nice discussion around how we can make more cohesive science, how we can do less compliance science or worse yet combat science and more sort of management science. Uh, so I just think, you know, principles uh, around the table should really use this opportunity to ask the tough questions around can we really do things differently? Because it would be a missed opportunity if we all just, you know, have our folks attend but then sort of keep our, uh, keep our approaches the same they've always, always been. So it would be helpful at a future meeting to really see the extent to which we've actually changed you know, our, our collective or individual approach on science as a result of this process. And at the discussion, it's a science needs assessment, but a big part of it will be science questions, but a part of it is governance issues. So the, the last part will be all in how do we how do we actually do this in a, in a more effective way and collaboratively across the board. So yeah, as Commander said, we strongly encourage you to either attend and stand or have your staff attend so that you can get and the events briefing paper really does lay all, all, all this out, kind of our thinking behind this and all that. So I, I think you have a little extra time to, to maybe clean that up. Okay, thank you. So uh, on to agenda item three ecosystem based management. Uh, this agenda item was partly inspired 
by a CIP uh, workshop held in November. And as I listened to the case studies from the Klamath and the Santa Ana River watershed and the San Joaquin River restoration program that resulted from an 18 year lawsuit, um, I thought that it would be beneficial for all of us to, to hear what really is ecosystem based management, what are its attributes and why we should get uh, really moving and grooving and pick up the pace. So Dr. Jeff Mount or Dr. Doon, as he sometimes you knows, <laughs> opening this event, I'd welcome Jeff. Yeah. Oh, and I'm sorry, you have his slide presentation in the front of you. And behind you, turn behind you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little bit. Uh, thanks, Susan, and, and thanks to everybody. I, I know all of you in some way, shape, or form, uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this. Uh, I have been told to keep it short, which is never my strong suit, uh, but I'm told to keep it short so we can get some discussion going. What I'm presenting today is essentially a very short version of a paper we published last uh, December, uh, and that paper was produced by, was led by actually some questions from some of you. And for years we've been telling everybody, well, you really got to take an ecosystem-based approach to your management rather than a single species based approach. And then everybody would nod their head and then they would say, what the hell does that mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that literally was the trip. We finally said, okay, we gotta get off, we gotta get, off, get off our rear ends and actually describe it. That was the, 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 the roots of this. So we can have the first slide. Um, now, it is not my intention to make any of you make crazy uh, by what I'm gonna say here. These are our broad observations. We've got thir 13 authors on this, very prominent. Uh, biologists that you know, that many many names you know quite well, <clears throat> worked long in the system, including some youngsters. But basically, what drove us to our conclusion was that the was the first was the error that the inherent societal error that's being made uh, that Newsom has, has called out this notion of binaries. We constantly read the delta in binaries, water for fish and water for farms. It's a huge mistake. What we are failing to recognize is that water, as it as it comes from its source and moves out through the delta or any watershed, and by the way, this report was for all of California, not just the Delta, there's something else besides the Delta here. Uh, we often overlook the multiple benefits of water as it moves through the system. Uh, it's well represented in the Sacramento Valley in particular. So this was, this, this has annoyed us as researchers for years, so we got to call it out. The second is the, the unavoidable conclusion of a long-term decline in native bio, freshwater biodiversity in California. This is the report after report comes, comes out on this, and this is this is actually, things are not getting better. Despite billions of dollars in investments, they're getting worse in this system. We say, well, so does that mean we just try harder what we're doing or should we take another look at this? And of course, this is the issue that comes up that Carl probably stays awake all night worrying about. It's the number of vulnerable species that probably should be listed and maybe a lawsuit away from the existing vastly outnumbers the current number that are listed. And it's highly disruptive to list these species, whether it's state or federal. And then finally, the complaint that many of us have had for years, no matter how clean we are uh, in our approach to these things, so the use of the Endangered Species Act as the primary lever for managing water is, uh, we, we have argued repeatedly in PPIC publications over the years, a mistake, and that we need to take a much more holistic approach. So we proposed in this an alternative path, and an alternative path seems like it sounds like we invented it, we did not. Uh, I mean, there, this is the, we, we actually stole a whole lot of ideas from Australia. Uh, uh, in fact, we stole them from all over the place. We have no original ideas. We just package them. <laughs> <laughs> and that is this, this shift toward ecosystem-based management. And that's where we think it is working the best. And there's, it's important that I make clear, this is not ecosystem management. This is ecosystem-based management, and there is a fundamental difference. First of all, what you are focused on is instead of listed species, Look at all the heat and light that went into two species which are teetering on the edge of extinction. Or we just have to deal with that so much this, in, this, in this past year and focus with biological opinions. But the fact is, what we really are care about is the ecosystem condition and how we describe that ecosystem condition rather than the listed species within it. And, and so ecosystem-based management focuses on that as your primary metric rather than populations of listed species. Most importantly, it absolutely integrates human uses of the ecosystem as part of it. It creates both consequences and opportunities, the way humans use it. Like, again, use rice straw uh, as, a, as, a, as a classic example of human uses of the watershed, which can be used to also create benefit for ecosystem conditions. And our argument 
it is you get when you take this approach you get, and you do the right accounting, which is extremely important, you get greater net benefits and you reduce water content. And we can show you we have some examples of this slide uh, within. So again, being very short, I'm going to go very direct. But one of the things we did is we made up our own personal list of must haves to make this work. And you're going to hear some very familiar stuff because this is embedded in, in the stuff that Susan and others are here are working on. And that is the, the, that we need a better framework for ecosystem-based management rather than really focus principally on these single, single species-based approaches. And it starts with deciding what a desirable ecosystem condition is. I've, I've had beers many times with Carla and Emmett, and I've asked her the same question. What do you think the delta should look like? What do you want? What is that condition you're after? And then she says, ask Wade. <laughs> so we kick that idea around, and to the credit of the Delta Stewardship Club, they've actually started to get to that, to, to get to describing that condition that they're after. But I don't think we've done a good job of reminding people who the beneficiaries of this are. And we say that, we have very broad terms, we need to be much more specific. And of course, that's where metrics and performance measures come along, including <coughs> better accounting. We're going to, Greg Gertrell and I are writing a little piece to remind you all that we do a terrible job of accounting for water in the Delta how it works. In fact, Carl, I blame you and your organization for the way you actually account for some of that. We wrote about that in 2017. It was very unkind things about CWR and the way they do that. We need a better accounting system. Uh, happy to talk more about that. We are all in favor of collaborative science and civic support. I am a veteran of combat science. I headed the Independent Science Board with all the range of wager became the lead scientist in the Delta. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been in the trenches for years. So this is a, we really are, and we are changing, and John Kelvin deserves a lot of credit for that. He is really changing the culture for that. The thing when we did this report, the number one complaint we had was the lack of regulatory alignment. Getting the agencies to all paddle together in the same way and say our priorities are all the same, and it's that tension that exists and how you get there. So we listed the best way to get there, comprehensive agreements, which you guys call voluntary agreements. And the reason we call them comprehensive agreements is they're going on in lots of other places and they don't call them voluntary agreements there. So we came up with the term comprehensive agreements. So we see that as key, and of course, the COVID site is reliable funding is this may be the most important thing that happens, the boom bus cycle of bond funding is killing us. So these frameworks are key, but we also wanted to highlight that we tend to use one tool a lot. Uh, and not other tools, we tend to, that, that the knob is easiest to turn, is the knob we tend to turn, rather than saying we've got to turn all the knobs. So we, we, we broke it down into five. For years now, uh, actually, Brian Gray, one of the co-authors, wrote about this in 1986, uh, and it was a proposal, and we did it with Buzz Thompson from Stanford, and Hannick, and Jaylon, and others. We kept saying, we need to stop the way we're currently allocating the to the environment. And that is, everybody wants so much sure, so many assurances we prescribe things finer and finer and finer so there's zero flexibility in what we can do. We can't adjust. We can talk about adaptive management until we're blue in the face, but we've painted ourselves in corner. So we proposed an alternative, and many of you have heard this before, and that is to start allocating a block of water in the environment. To Joaquin's credit, and, and, and to the State Board's credit, they said that in phase one. That's essentially what they said, but everybody interpreted it as unimpaired flows, misinterpreted it as unimpaired flows. They did say a block of water that could be that is an ecosystem water budget. This is what they do in Australia. They do, the, a lot, uh, do this a lot. And it creates that ability to respond to just not, in, not just individual storm events, but individual droughts, but new knowledge, new adaptive management experiments. So we're suggesting you think very carefully about that as an ecosystem water budget. And then the second is the, knob, the, the flows only knob is insufficient. I don't think there's anybody here who would disagree with that. Um, that is the connection of structural habitat to functional flows. So we are. We are very much in favor of these, uh, basically tailoring your landscape modifications to direct uh, operation of that ecosystem water budget, budget to create functional flows. Um, what's working in the background for us is co-managing water quality and quantity at the same time. Harmful algal blooms are the um, coronavirus of the of the today. We don't understand it. We know what's happening. We know what's happening out there. This is scary stuff. But this is why you have to manage water quality and water quantity at the same time. And I do want to remind all of you here that all of, most of our native species, the ones whose populations are down, are now conservation dependent for the rest of our lives, our children's lives, and our grandchildren's lives. And we will be involved in the conservation. So active management of native species and non-native species is unavoidable. And then finally, the last thing where I insult 
helped lots of people over the years. This is when I was on the Independent Science Board, and I would hear these great stories about somebody who's doing you know, a few thousand acres of habitat restoration. It's a nice gardening project. But what we need to do is get to scale. So some of the proposals that are floating around, are, including out of the voluntary agreements, are starting to get at that question of scale. And we think this is probably the single biggest problem is getting at scale. So those are what are a list of must-haves. Must is it legal? Is, this is the question. Well, this is why it's great having lawyers on your team, usually. Uh, <laughs> but I'm great. Brian Gray is a fabulous lawyer. You all know Brian. And uh, he basically led our team of young students, a couple of, a couple of young, young lawyers, and they tore all this apart. And they came up and said, it is embedded, ecosystem-based management is embedded in the Clean Water Act and the Quarter Flow Act. And in fact, when you read that language carefully, that is precisely what they say. And that's the balancing that what needs to have to do. And within our constitution of the public trust and reasonable use, that same sort of notion of fully integrating human uses with ec and ecosystem conditions, they're all there. So we would argue the law demands it. And rather than simply saying, well, we're going to just focus on the Water. And then under the ESAs, this is something that Carl and others struggle with all the time, um, is how to do this under uh, the federal and state ESAs. And, and we, we are very critical in our report about uh, agency culture around ESAs and trying to take the most conservative approach within the ESAs rather than taking risks. We recognize that they're going to have to take risks in order to do ecosystem based management. So we argue there's a lot more flexibility in the laws than currently being taken advantage of, but of course there's HCPs and NCCPs as an option. Um, this is where some legislation might help on the NCCP side to make it a little easier to do them. Uh, I bring up HCPs, I'll give you an example, one, a very good one in just a second, but we just feel like there's much more flexibility in the law. And all right, the water quality and water rights law is required for this argument. Okay, we didn't invent this stuff. There are lots of people doing this already and, and around the world. Uh, as I say, we, we, we accrue all credit here uh, and sign all blame. But they, they, we, we basically did, a, we did, we profiled 12 different uh, uh, water management uh, settings uh, and, we, and we, took, we took a hard look at them, really good at 12, including looking closely at the Delta plan. Um, and we found a number of really great examples. I think by far the emerging best urban example is the Upper Santa Ana watershed. You all ought to take a look at what they're doing. They have an ecosystem water budget. They, I mean, I'm really impressed with the, with the approach that they're taking. And there they're using wastewater basically to keep their systems going and preparing their structural habitat with that. They've got tremendous governance. It's under an HCP, which is being adopted as a regional water quality control plan. Our proposal is that it's, it be the other way around. That these things be water quality control plans, that these agreements, and these agreements like the voluntary agreement be brought into and absorbed into the water quality control plan. The Delta plan is a shining example uh, of one that thinks ecosystem first, uh, rather than single species. When you look at the Delta plan, I mean, there's, of course, an acknowledgement of the decline of native species and means saving, but the fact is it's much more ecosystem based. When you look at your ecosystem element, it has a lot of characteristics that are listed. So, this is this moving beyond species recovery plans. So let me wrap this up so we can have a conversation about it. Um, the, the report reminds us that what we're doing is not working, and we say um, doing it harder is unlikely to achieve a different goal. Uh, and that has made us no friends uh, in some communities, but that's, that, that, is our, that was the consensus view of the 13, 13 co-authors. That we need something that allows us to be much more adaptable and much more flexible. And I, Great to talk about adaptive management, but you can't do it unless you've got the ability to adapt. And so building flexibility is absolutely key. Also, as John knows well, we just had a hearing, they just had a hearing in the Independent Science Board in which the premise was made that, that the pace of change in the Delta is outpacing the ability of science to keep. Uh, and so if that's the case, you really better build some flexibility. Our argument is this approach uh, and is faces the most difficult problems, Carl. Carl's organization has to deal with, that is, the likelihood of future listing of species. The only way to tackle this is to do it on an ecosystem basis. You can't 
not come back. Easy space, easy space. Too complicated. The thing we like about it, it integrates human uses of ecosystems with the conservation objectives. Too many, we, too many times we view humans as, as invasive species in these systems, whereas they are fully integrated within the species. And then the last thing is done well as a plan, which is brought forward under, in our argument, a water quality control plan and signed off to by all the agencies, federal and state agencies. You then have a single plan to work towards. I think that's probably the, the notion, and of course we know it falls out of that. Multi-benefit projects rise to the top as a priority right off the bat. So this is going to be a big one. With that, I think I'm done. Thank you. If I can answer, I don't know, Susan, you're in charge. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so Ron will quickly overview the desired ecosystem conditions that Jeff mentioned, and then we'll get to the discussion. Okay, I'll give it a give it a shot here. Good afternoon, DPIC members. Chair Tatian, uh, again, Ron Mill, Sarah Program Manager within the Planning Division at the Council, and I've uh, been the staff lead in the development of the ecosystem amendment to the Delta Plan over the past three years. So uh, this afternoon, I've been asked to give sort of a lightning talk if you will, on the ecosystem amendment. Um, just briefly, a little bit of, of history and context. Prior to coming uh, to the council, I worked for about seven years at the Department of Water Resources as the lead scientist on the conservation strategy for the Central Valley flood system. And early in this work, uh, we made a very conscious decision to step outside of the typical paradigm of identifying species impacts of projects and negotiating mitigation needed to offset those impacts. Instead, we sought to shift the design and implementation of projects to an approach that really improved river and floodplain function in the sense that it would then benefit the species that rely on those functions. Um, we have the explicit goal of implementing projects that reduce flood risk while contributing to the recovery of species. And through this approach, we anticipated short-term reductions in regulatory burdens through project design and long-term reductions as species were recovered from uh, the list. And this work really required us to develop data and models regarding opportunities to recover the function of Central Valley rivers, so the physical aspects of the landscape and then their floodplain. And also, um, it required us to focus on incorporating the rich information lying out there in species recovery and conservation plans. And we also did look at species that were not listed, but likely to be listed, so other imperiled species. So I'm really excited to see this work along with the council staff's recent work on the Delta Plan Amendment being recognized now in uh, Dr. Mount and his colleagues' report and in the presentation today. It's exciting to see. Um, so stepping back three years, from uh, this year, in October 2017, we started in earnest on the Chapter 4 Amendment. Um, the efforts that I mentioned on Central Valley Rivers were really provided a strong conceptual approach to how we were thinking about amending the Delta Plan. And in addition, again, the fundamental data sets and tools were also available for us to stand upon as we put together the Delta Plan Amendment. And so over the past three years, we've developed a scientific basis and a draft amendment. These efforts have undergone extensive review by the science community, including the Delta Independent Science Board and Science Program. And then, of course, um, we've worked through public reviews and received comments from the public. The amendment, uh, in the end, this amendment provides the first comprehensive rationale and approach for meeting the ecosystem goals of the Delta Reform Act. And the amendment filled the void left by the demise of the Bay Delta Conservation Plan in both the Delta Plan structure and then in terms of the landscape level of conservation planning that it provides for the region. So simply put, the amendment is a call to action for those undertaking natural resource management within the Delta. It's based on best available science. It provides a vision, a set of core strategies for achieving that vision. And those core strategies speak to a set of regulatory policies, recommendations, and performance measures. It also provides data, tools, and guidance um, that serve as a foundation for future reconnaissance level restoration planning. So the core strategies of the amendment address the physical and biological aspects of recovery.
covering the Delta ecosystem. They are, of course, and you all are, many of you are familiar with these, create more natural functional flows, restore ecosystem function, protect land and restoration, uh, for restoration and safeguard against land loss, protect native species, and reduce the impact of non-native invasive species, and improve institutional coordination to support implementation of ecosystem protection, restoration, and enhancement. This last core strategy is, is really the bureaucratic uh, aspects of our work that we're all very familiar with. Next slide. Ron, I'm going to pause you just a minute. Um, some of our members have to leave early, and I was hoping to start with our team on, on the discussion about the different days So what I suggest is that basic members <coughs> take a good hard look at, at what's in the binder, um, and we go ahead and start with our team on the next for the discussion. Okay. Well, one, I want to thank staff for their work. I know on the ecosystem chapter, and uh, you know, our staff has been engaged in this update as well. It's a very, it's, it's, it's a good structured document that really focuses specifically on the Delta and, and really does try to start to ask, answer some questions as to at what scale do we need to start to see the restoration happen. So I would want to just acknowledge and thank you for them to state Susan, to get some reaction to, to Jeff's comments as well uh, on all this. You know, certainly, um, you know, the State Water Board in Porter Cologne is, is charged to consider quantity and quality. It's just that you look at our nine regional water quality control boards and their structure to enumerate all the beneficial uh, uh, uses of the lakes, streams, rivers, basins, and estuaries that in, in, in inhabit this, this space that we call the state, uh, broken, up, broken up into the nine regional boards. And so their structure you know, was first envisioned to somewhat be reflective and definitely uh, infuse a, a watershed approach to uh, the, the water quality regulations that we pursue and also the water uh, administration that the board does. Uh, you know, Port of Cologne is 50 years on now. Uh, and so you think about what 50 years means for state board's activities, for what what are the status of those river states, uh, lakes, Green states and estuaries were then what they are now, and what we find are regulatory agencies that have been able to improve water quality uh, in those in those bodies have continued to pursue uh, it, uh, uh, programs that try to improve uh, the, the, the the condition of the ecosystems we find, which you know we degraded uh, drastically from the millennia that you know some 300,000. Uh, uh, Humans inhabited, Native Americans, Native Californians inhabited here in the state. And so we have this huge legacy to overcome. And those regulatory programs for the last 50 years have done some measure of benefit. To your point, they're not going to be able to do enough. Not at the change of pace that we see with climate change, not at, with the challenges that we have, and not given not just those imperative uh, sort of difficulties uh, uh, on, the, on the landscape as we develop our water systems, as we allow for 40 million of us to inhabit the state and for us to be the, the economies that we are. Um, and so it is a question of, I sometimes feel, generational things. What are we going to do with those systems? And more importantly, what are we going to do with the regulatory systems that we need to develop in order to respond to these challenges? And I think that um, it's going to require us to maybe, not unlike on the infrastructure side, where we find ourselves inheritors of these generational projects that need generational reinvestment and a, a continued thought as to how they're going to operate in the decades ahead. Uh, but how also then do these agencies that we've established uh, work amongst themselves and continue to create the trust? And I think that's the common theme sometimes of this work, is the trust among these many disparate actors that you can have, landowners, water diverters, uh, dischargers, you know, the whole, the whole uh, the regulatory space that the board and the regional board deal with. And uh, so I appreciate the circumstances around this, maybe the the, the question or discussion that it calls is uh, how do we emphasize, you know, regulatory agencies or not, or what is their role? But certainly, Porter Cologne uh, did try to envision uh, 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 an ecosystem approach to watershed to their regulatory uh, management, uh, and I think it's going to require all of our creative thought as to how all of our agencies then continue to uh, pursue this sort of work, which is, uh, you know, not cannot be driven by the ESA. You know, uh, a nice thing. It is an emergency room approach to 
we see challenges, and we have to your point over over sort of leaned on those. And so again, it kind of begs the question: What other tools are out there? The HPC supports the Habitat Conservation Plan through the HPC Act are, are, are a great example of ways that even the ESA can be flexible. But what are those greater authorities, and how will the state continue to challenge uh, address these challenges? Uh, anyway, I, I, I appreciate the space that you created for the discussion, and I'll uh, the challenge that thing. Uh, it is you know, 50 years of quarter to learn. Kind of a moment to think what what have we uh, been able to, to learn from that, and what does it mean for the future of these these agencies and these laws that we really depended upon? Uh, and I think California has actually a tremendous amount of leadership generally in space given the quarter to three days in water. And so <coughs> okay. well, I wanted to ask you a tough question, which is some of my colleagues that I talked to that are least supportive of the voluntary agreement suggest that California has tried this notion of providing an environmental block of water uh, for uh, species protection or for improving environment, the environment. And from their perspective, it doesn't work. I have zero understanding of that history. So help us understand if you got asked that question or experienced that criticism, how you would respond. So what we're describing is nothing like the environmental water account, which I don't think there's anyone who, it seemed like a good idea. I like the title. Um, it was the application that went, went, went sideways. And it's nothing like what it was. So what was the learning lesson? What, what, what didn't work there that you would make sure? I have to choose my words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, it was money. Uh, and the system kind of got gamed. And it really, in the end, most people think, it actually did some good. The reviews, the reviews of it, it did. And partly what it did was it brought some peace. Uh, th th there's value. Sometimes it's worth putting up money to bring some peace to, to the warrant. But from an ecosystem, it was not very effective. We're proposing something very different, very different. And that's why when we started worrying, worrying about acronyms, acronyms early on, the last thing we wanted was EWA to be the acronym because of the bad history. But basically what we're saying here is we want, we want you all to, to appoint an ecosystem trustee who becomes the trustee of a series of assets that belong to the environment. And those assets are going to be water-based. I mean, in this case, it's going to be a, a volume of water depending on a given, given water your type. And that person, that trustee, and like we, we, we actually recommend that you a trustee because the problem is everybody's in charge and nobody's in charge and we have long said you need to have somebody who has the authority and the responsibility to manage that ecosystem budget. And the reason it's important is that if you have a budget and you have assets, and of course, the, you know, we, have, we have proposed in the past that this budget actually needs to act like a water equivalent of water. This is totally different. And it can be traded, uh, it can be stored, uh, and, then, and, and in fact, it can be managed flexibly. That's key. That's absolutely key because what we, we I mean, I can give you an example. Just look, look over, look, look during the, look during the 2015, I think it was 2015 drought. We had three storms that came through. Had we had the ability to flexibly manage what, with some, some environmental water, we could have stretched out the size of those storms a little bit. We made a huge difference in the delta. Would have got a little water out on the floodplain and would have helped with some very, very stressed conditions during that drought. But we couldn't because we painted ourselves into a regulatory corner and we couldn't, we couldn't act. So that's, that's the, the big difference. In our, this is nothing like the EWA in that, in that regard. I, I think there's going to have to be some money involved. Uh, that, that's a key. But the fact is, you can imagine that you're the person running your ecosystem water budget, your trustee, would have the opportunity to sell water. Finally, let me. One last thing that's really different is because you have a trustee, that person now sits at the table with the water managers. The environment is no longer viewed as just a constraint. Okay? Now the environment is a partner. And that's, a, that's the big success in parts of Australia, where the environment, where the water manager sits down, they set up a plan every fall, these are the things we're going to do with the following things happen. And then they work with the water folks to try to say, you know, look, we'll get some, can we trade you guys some water out of your watershed? Water on your watershed, so you can meet these objectives. And in the meantime, we'll, we'll be leaning at this particular time. That's putting them at the table. And I think that is a complete change in the way we normally run. The way we run today, the environment's a constraint. I don't know if that answers your question. It sure does. Okay. I'm one of the people who actually wrote I'm sorry. Um, I appreciate this very much. It's, um, it's good to see the DVIP. 
sort of endorsing what we've been working on um, for many, many months, last years, just on the voluntary agreement. There's a lot of echoes of things that we um, intend to incorporate in those agreements from the functional flows, the flexibility to manage, to the working more collaboratively together, um, to make things work, the environmental trustees. So all of that is um, great to see. Um, and it, um, it, it makes me inspired to continue um, on that effort. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me any questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you have other folks have questions for Jeff or comments or questions for Ron? Just pour me in the finish because I talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, but it can wait. Okay, sure. So, Ron, did you, were, were we picked up uh, on, uh, I think you were on the slide too. Uh, we could go to the next slide, I guess. And uh, I could talk a little bit about the performance measures. Is that helpful? Um, so, again, uh, ecosystem amendment, core strategies, there's a policy and recommendations framework, set of performance measures. Um, I just have a few remarks here uh, regarding those, and then maybe I would. Um, defer back to conversation. So uh, measures based on, again, mm -hmm. best available information, uh, we leverage 10 recovery and conservation plans, which collectively address 120 special status species. And there have been um, Delta Independent Science Board review and then also an external expert review on the measures themselves. So they are very robust at this point. Uh, they quantify essentially targets for reestablishing land and water connections, restoration of natural communities, improvements in fish migration, and geographically specific targets for subsidence reversal. Uh, they add to the existing ecosystem performance measures in the plan, which treat the topic of flow restoration and non native species management. So, in uh, comprehensively address the issues that we're facing with the Delta ecosystem. And metrics for each of these performance measures target, uh, for each of the targets allow us to place our existing and potential restoration actions. So, for example, projects under the Eco Restore Initiative or restoration undertaken through Proposition 1, we're able to um, place those uh, projects in the context of the target in the performance measures and really explicitly understand the contribution of our restoration actions to the science based <laughs> recovery needs of the ecosystem. And it allows us to track and understand, uh, again, meeting those overall recovery goals for the, for the system. Um, last slide. Just overall, uh, one, one additional component to the policies and performance measures is, uh, is the planning guidance. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time assembling data sets and tools, and those are attachments to the amendment available for initiatives that may want to explore um, future implementation of the strategy in the amendment. So whether that be you know, reconsidering federal interest in the Delta uh, as it pertains to restoration authorities or uh, seeking to improve permitting efficiency um, maybe through something like the regional conservation investment <laughs> strategy of the department. Um, so this is a pretty comprehensive package that, that really attempts to, um, to look around the endangered species uh, mitigation paradigm and, and provide a holistic vision and a set of tools to achieve that vision. And the last point I wanted to make was just to express uh, appreciation to the committee. We've had really constructive engagement with the staff in each of the EPIC member agencies, and that's been uh, really helpful in making this a strong amendment, and I'll pause there. I want to echo what um, Ron just said about the uh, staff of all of the EPIC agencies who have devoted some time. Um, Ron and, and the team have been at this for two and a half years um, with an advisory committee and an awful lot of what you see in, in the double plan amendment, the current draft is, is more than a double stewardship plan for staff. Thank you. So 
So the question before uh, um, the CFIC agencies is, um, you know, what are your programs across the agencies that contribute to ecosystem-based management, or what obstacles do you see in terms of picking up the pace and really getting going on ecosystem-based management? Maybe the Delta can <laughs> 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 Um, well, I, I do have a few thoughts. I mean, it's obviously it's difficult to, to create a, a significant shift to each of the base management in a system that we have. So I like to think, you know, what are the opportunities to actually make reasonable and market change early? And I think, and to me, it comes to two issues. It's, it's really shifting the culture as well as some of the ways we think about the funding, that, uh, even the funding that's coming in the near term. Um, we talked a little bit about this in the green tape. There is a cultural element here. Carla, I want to give you kudos because I've heard uh, some of the videos that you've been doing for your staff and specifically say, we want to push you to create to solve problems. And then we've got we've got coverage for you in doing this. So for each agency that's really looking at how do we create that flexibility between ecosystem-based management and the regulations that are required to implement, where is that flexibility? And can we tell staff from top to bottom that that flexibility exists and you, you're, you're backing them as they're, they're maneuvering through that space and encouraging them to take a, a more expansive and, and, um, and sort of risk-based entrepreneurial approach. I think that's really great. Um, the other opportunity I see is that we're, we're considering um, uh, a rather large bond fund moving forward. The, the last bond prop one, which brought money for us, uh, demanded that everything be open solicitation. That's really challenging in terms of trying to identify priorities and look at ecosystem-based management and doing restoration at the proper scale. So thinking about the flexibility and the language that we could see in this next funding round to provide more benefit, more opportunities to be more flexible and, and take a more return um, ecosystem-based approach can be really important piece to consider. Um, and then I, I like to say I'm, I'm always the first offended when Jeff calls my uh, my, my project, gardening project. I mean, certainly, when you do look at the need to integrate the human element and multi-tempest projects, we are out of necessity when we work in it. They're relatively small scale in places, and I do think that's okay. That's, that's a beneficial thing. It helps create the expectation and the learning about how we do it at bigger scales as well. So, um, <coughs> yeah, I'm excited to be I do think we, I think we have an imperative right now, given given where we are and the need to not continue to do things that aren't working, uh, particularly climate change. To look at these cultural shifts, flexible funding, and uh, move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Jeff, I really appreciate the presentation and Ron, um, just really listening and learning and trying to wrap my mind around what you guys are thinking. Um, I, I have to say, as one of the federal ESA implementers at the table, you know that the fundamental purpose of the act was written by Congress is to protect imperial species and the ecosystems on which they depend. It's written right there in the in the law, page number one. Um, so. There was something inherently, as we said, support of planet, water quality, and clean water, which I agree with. I think, you know, the framers of these laws, these regulatory laws, did provide the overall intent and understanding that there are ecosystems that species depend on, and so species management can never, in my mind, be separated from ecosystem management. Um, so I, I, I'm trying to wrap my mind a little bit about what you're seeing there, and I do certainly agree that um, as I think about species management and recovering species uh, that NOAA Fisheries has trust responsibilities for, I mean, we are always trying to see that in a more comprehensive way and integrated way and trying to support um, efforts to um, look at ecosystems broadly, look at actions broadly. I think often I hear that, you know, agencies for one reason or another are only focused on water. and. That is not how it looks in our office. I mean, we're broadly looking at lots of different um, aspects of what species need for recovery. We've also, you know, I think the recovery planning lens is really a good lens to look at habitat. And we put out a multi-species recovery plan. So I think, again, getting away from single species management, yes. But as you're doing, if you're looking at all the different species and all the different metrics and putting those all together, hopefully, 
that gives you some sort of reasonable proxy for you know system metrics. So I think that's a I think that's a critical way to go. Um, habitat conservation planning is mentioned a couple of times, so we've got you know many examples. I think of applicants coming to us for Section 10 and really wanting to have long-term habitat plans in place for business reasons and having the services meet those needs and with a sort of business mindset look at conservation goals and um, recovery goals that really get what you need um, through that lens. So that's obviously a tool that's out there. So um, like any agency, you know, we have very small resources and can't, you know, put everything in place that all the parties here want. So it obviously takes everybody here to partner to create those ecosystem plans. And certainly we've been participating in the VA process along with other federal agencies and um, are ready to lend our assistance to those kind of more comprehensive efforts. I think those have a lot of uh, potential. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Maybe just following on what you had placing a song out at this point. I don't know if there's anything on our own. Uh, maybe one place I'll start is Bureau of Reclamation and Fish and Wildlife Service has long been implementing projects under the Central Valley Project Improvement Act. Many of those garden scale projects. <laughs> but some of those growing to the point that um, they've had, you know, ecosystem or watershed level effects. Uh, Hugh Creek would be a good example. Where we worked hard on aquatic connectivity, providing flows, um, all in support of the agricultural community. And the Creek and, and managed to uh, restore one of the strongest one of the spring lines, you know, down to the um, that has Ecosystem effects. We have snapping fish coming back from an area that weren't before. So a lot of the community in and around the stream are bringing nutrients to the ocean. The other example you brought up early on, um, or at least was implied, was the work with rice farms. And that partly was a portion of the Central Valley Project Improvement Act that incentivized that effort that you know, now is one of the shining stars of what we've been able to do for a, a broad field of species in the system. Uh, and now looking and working hard to expand that, as you well know, to uh, more stream aquatic benefits and some artificial floodplains or, or areas where we're bringing nutrients back in that make sense. Those are just a Few examples from from my perspective where we've worked successfully in the past and we'll continue to work in that way going forward.
And I think that's only getting harder because everything is happening at a more accelerated rate in this climate. And I think the delta, you know, the trajectory for change is just it's getting faster and faster. And so um, that, um, for me, provokes um, kind of a sense of anxiety. So when I have a sense of anxiety about that, um, kind of have, and now being engaged in the comprehensive nature of the voluntary agreements, which to me is really important and actually helped to solve a problem we could never really solve in DCT, which is what was happening upstream, right? So now we've got uh, something where we're really trying to connect the upstream watershed down to the estuary. That's great. Um, we've got a level of complexity in terms of water users who are all trying to bring something to the table, um, which makes it difficult. I hear you on accounting. We haven't solved that problem yet in this way, but we're working up to it. But to me, um, in no setting, somehow flexibility seems harder. It's harder, I would just observe, it's harder to find this kind of elusive person who is vested in this, with this authority to make these risk-based decisions about where to allocate water because, you know, water and the economy are so intertwined. Um, I don't think we've really figured out that piece yet. I think in the voluntary agreement, we have some ideas that we need to move towards that. That's going to be hard. I would observe on a smaller scale, which is really where DWR is actually in, in the last couple of years down the Delta kind of more restoration. I think for almost the smaller scale, the more comfortable we are with flexibility. So we're actually able to do these NHPT, I'm thinking of Solano County and the cash flow area where we know we want to do a significant amount of restoration and we know we need to bring solutions to the table that um, maintain a degree of flexibility, but also provide an on-ramp for local landowners so we're not, you know, moving sort of regulatory problems, you know, off of one party onto another. And in those places, actually, and we're having some sort of, um, all right, I'll say success. You say it. I think we're having a little bit of success there um, with people feeling more comfortable about these kinds of, um, governance structures that are by definition going to have a degree of flexibility. So I'm I'm wondering with all the work that you guys have done to look at other areas that have um, embraced ecosystem based management, what observations can you make about the complexity of those systems, the complexity of things we're trying to deal with in the Delta, which is one create something that's more landscape scale from basically ocean, estuary, upper watershed. Then we're also at the same time trying to introduce this element of flow and non-flow uh, that is also very kind of place specific. So what does that, that what does that circumstance suggest about governance and how we might continue to approach that? The easiest answer is it makes it very, very difficult. <laughs> you were right. Uh, it is the complexity of the Delta and then the, the fact that we are, we are dealing with basically trade-offs. We have to we have to tackle those very, very difficult trade-offs, and that of course requires a great deal of leadership to make those things work. So it is difficult. And this is why what's in here is this approach of the notion of assets to the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, that the, the asset, by granting assets to the environment, the environment is, is sitting in what inspired this was years ago we took a look in Victoria, South Australia, where they tried to deal with their problems are not as complex, even though you know they would disagree with that in the conversations. If, 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 but they are dealing with a watershed scale problem. They're, they're, they're all the way into the Murray Darling Basin, uh, along with their headwaters, which are the primary source of both agricultural water and supplies in cities. There they made an interesting decision. They on the assets for the environment, they actually allocated storage to the environment. And, Proposed this to a number of people the way out of the voluntary agreements. Stop arguing about down to triple I mean, significant figures, arguing over significant figures in outside of the Delta. Instead, say, okay, environment, here's a million acre feet of storage in the system. You figure out how to operate it. You've got storage. 
That might be a simpler way to do it. Look, well, let me rephrase that. Simple for me to say. Uh, <laughs> it might be damn hard to do it, but they actually allocate storage. But, Carl, I, I have to be direct about this, and this goes to everyone else. In, in this, we do not have the science to tell you that the decisions you make now will create the following results. So it's going to fall somewhere in here. There's going to be, have to be a bit of a leap of faith in all of this. On, on all sides, there has to be a bit of a leap of faith, which is why the government structure has to be really simple. It's actually very, very good. There's lots of involvement in this. So I, I just can't tell, tell you that in a system as complex and rapidly changing as this one is. This is the part that I think the scientists I find so disturbing is how quickly things are changing. Uh, and that's, that's a little frightening. Mm -hmm. idea. So there, you have to set broader goals, flexibility to achievement. Narrow and specific. So I think that's the only choice we have. But so one alternative, as I say, instead of trying to, I get it. If you if you're going to take X amount of acre feet out of each one of these tributaries, it gets really really complicated to manage. You, you do have to build a water mass. <laughs> <laughs> He's <ready> to go. <laughs> as payback for what you wrote on our last round. <laughs> uh, the uh, um, but it, again, I just think you have to vest the authority mm -hmm. in here and have somebody sit in the deep water. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you get chewed up. Now, I can give you some examples where this might be you know, one model you might want to look at, and that's the U Boat Court. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as much as Curry <laughs> wants to strangle you every time I talk about this notion of the deep system trustee, because he feels as though he's doing a good job, it's, and I can tell that he's about to retire. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is this constant tension yeah. between him having to meet the needs of his water suppliers along with flood controls, and I was working in the upper watershed. This is as comprehensive as I can, mm -hmm. as I can point to. But when it comes down to it, his goal is to meet the regulatory obligation that he has and to supply as much water as he can. What I would like to set up there is that we've got, we meet the co-equal goals by essentially setting up a vested interest in the environment and allowing that to be managed. Mm -hmm. the same way we, we, we set up the co-equal goals more than a decade ago. Uh, this would be one can be approved by the state board, I don't know. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? This is the state. Carla asked my question oh, about okay. that elusive person with authority. I, I, I wanted to, I wanted, I was hoping you would elaborate on the trustee. And who could possibly, as Carl Wilson, so, so, fill that role? So, so I can tell you, we wrote about this a lot back in 2017. And I, mean, I realized, you know, this, our ideas have a very short shelf life in this room. It's a 2017 generation. But we wrote a bunch about this uh, and how you would do it. And we looked at multiple different structures and how you might structure it. One would be the notion of the way we did it in the, in the early CalFed days, right, where everybody was at the table at the same time making decisions collectively. Uh, and that's, that, well, we know how that ended. Yeah, it didn't work out. But they, but, so that was, that's one idea. The other would be to have a trustee agency, which would logically either be, either be the state board or it would be uh, uh, California Fish and Wildlife or something like that. We didn't like either of those approaches because what we wanted to have was that notion of independence uh, and, 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 and people can make difficult decisions and have the authority to make. An agency like Carl's has all the baggage that comes with an agency. Uh, with it, I mean, it's a political influence, whether it's from the governor or you know, resistance to the side. And so that's why we ended up, but yeah, this is mostly the mind of Brian Graham, uh, uh, the, thing that it, the deep thinking process. Yeah, that's why we argue as a trustee. And it turns out, I mean, it's hard to keep harkening back to Victoria, Australia, but there's one person who actually ultimately makes that decision, those decisions. Uh, and there's one person who's in charge of developing a whole watering uh, I, and, they, and that they call water in the environment, environmental watering plan. And there's one person who's in charge of administering it. There's one person, the staff, who negotiates these things. And there's one person that does that. And that one person is in for a lot of grief, but that person has, a, has responsibility. I think that's the, that's the approach we were arguing for. Now, that person could live within Joaquin's shock, uh, so it could be in the state board, uh, because they're the ultimate regulator. The, the top of the food chain of regulation. But we also said it could just as easily be Campbell. Somebody like Campbell. <laughs> 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 I'm 
<laughs> Go back to Michael. Yeah. <laughs> well, something like him. Could you, could you imagine a scenario where it's different in every watershed? Yeah, in fact, we our, our original proposal when we said this is that every watershed in the, in the Delta system um, would would have a Yugo core, the equivalent of a Yugo core within it. So you've got somebody who runs it, and each one of those has their own trustee, and then there's the equivalent of the board of trustees that are pretty much together. Right? This group here would oversee it, they oversee the group of trustees manage. So the trustees can coordinate. So that when the Tuolumne and the Merced and the Stanislaus are trying to organize their their outflow uh, again to achieve ecosystem management objectives where they're actually working together. So there's a representative from the Bureau, or there's a representative from Sherlock or Distal Irrigation District, or somebody on the percent. Each of those, each of those representatives are working collaborating together. Uh, you know, this this was that was our original proposal. Let's go do something else. And then that was water master. Um,
tried to learn from that. I think that's a key component to recognize relative to any kind of existence of restoration or conservation activities in the Delta is that they have to have local engagement and file. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Phil. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to um, cut discussion short. We're, we're a little over the time allowed for this agenda item. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the, the robust discussion. Thank you, Dr. Dan. Yeah. <laughs> Are you saying that Ron is the elusive person? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I was congratulating you on doing a really great job. Yeah. So, uh, deserves credit. Um, so what, what the search council is proposing on this item is that, that we work with uh, DCA agency staff and, and try to, to do a compendium or, or at least an inventory of the kinds of programs and projects of the DCA agency that are contributing to the conservation management plan and thereby maybe discover some shared goals and see what we, what we have, what we're working with now and what we can use to move forward at a faster pace for the disease management. Um, on to agenda item four, critical needs for aquatic weed control. Uh, Deputy for Science, Elise Conrad, for Council, will be speaking to us about this urgent matter. The uh, submerged aquatic vegetation is, is uh, threatening to choke off not only our restoration efforts, but our water operations. I think Ernest, you mentioned, was it a zero control date or something that's affected, operation being affected? Yeah, by. this has been the last month. Shut down Jones for a while. I know Carl has got similar problems. <laughs> So this is a very urgent matter. And with that, Dr. Lee Cohen. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Titan and committee members. Really want to thank you for your time this afternoon to discuss invasive vegetation in the Delta. It's a pleasure to follow on the previous agenda item. I think this uh, challenge that we have in the Delta with invasive vegetation is really the place where we face a challenge for ecosystem-based management. And we need to ask ourselves the question of how will we protect also biodiversity in the face of rapid infestation of invasive plants? But uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the scale of the problem. So just to be clear, we're beyond the scale of gardening here. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to introduce my um, colleagues here that are presenting with me today. Dr. Dylan Chappell is a senior environmental scientist with the Delta Science Program. And he helped write the white paper provided today on this issue. So you'll see this. This is with your meeting material, um, where we go into a little bit more depth than we have time for today. Edward Hard is the program manager for the Aquatic Invasive Plant Control Program at State Parks and Recreation. And Dan Reardon is the program manager for the Fish Restoration Program at the Department of Water Resources. So all of these uh, groups really are, are linked in their efforts to address this issue. Our goal is to highlight some recent advances in science that illustrate the urgent need to identify effective control measures for submerged leaks. And attention to this issue is really needed now to protect current and future investment and restoration. We have partnered with multiple state and federal agencies and the Metropolitan Water District to write this white paper that summarizes the status of aquatic needs and aquatic needs and the control program. And so to start, uh, Dylan's going to provide some background on the issue and explain why this is particularly relevant to restoration now. Basically, so aquatic weeds are particularly, pro are particularly promising for collaborative action because, as you all know, they have a wide range of impacts in the Delta and beyond. They threaten restoration and overall ecological condition. They impact water conveyance. They impair recreational and commercial floating and they are extremely difficult and costly to control. There are three types of aquatic weeds found in the delta, submerged, floating, and emergent. And while all of these weed types affect the delta, our presentation today is really focused on submerged aquatic weeds and their impacts on tidal well and restoration. First point to make here um, is, of course, that submerged weed cover is expanding rapidly. 
Um, they've roughly doubled in cover since 2004, with rapid increases since 2014 in surveyed areas in the Delta, as you see here in this graph. On the left, we have the percent cover of submerged aquatic weeds in 2004. And on the right, you can see the rapid increase between 2014 mm -hmm. and 2018. Now, we are, we are now seeing weeds cover over one-third of surveyed waterways in the Delta. And notably, much of this expansion is occurring exactly where we are planning the restoration of shallow water tidal wetland habitats to benefit listed species like Delta. This expansion is particularly clear here in the North Delta. What we are seeing here is coverage of submerged aquatic weeds in orange and water and existing wetlands in blue. In gray are three restoration projects in the Cache Slough complex, Lookout Slough, Lower Yellow Ranch, and Prospect Island, which together account for nearly 6,500 acres of planned restoration. So really getting at the landscape scale here. Uh, in the top left, you can see in 2004, aquatic weed cover was minimal. And from 2014 to 2018, you can see the rapid expansion of aquatic weeds in the region. This is an issue because delta smelts are a primary target of these restoration efforts, and they do not use submerged aquatic weeds as habitat. This means that if these areas are invaded by submerged aquatic weeds, they will not function as delta smelt habitat as intended. Without coordinated action on management and research, aquatic weeds will likely compromise ecological function at planned restoration sites. This would put substantial investment in restoration at risk. Excuse me, Chair, can I ask a quick question on the previous slide? So, I know we have no data in the middle of the year, but so are the big jumps happening because of the drought? And then once the drought is over, what we're also seeing is once they're established, it's hard to eradicate that we're safely seeing right there. Yes, I think that's a great way to put it. The drought was a really good thing for me. Yes. But they have not gone away. Right. So even when you get to the like 2017, they're already established. And, uh, and especially for <laughs> submerged weeds, which is one of the reasons we're focusing on this today. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We are here. Um, so I wanted to emphasize that this issue is really particularly relevant to <coughs> because of the multiple state and federal mandates and initiatives that rely on effective control for submerged weeds. The Fish Restoration Program, which Dan referred to in a moment, is a major effort for habitat restoration that was created to fulfill requirements of the biological opinions for operation of state and federal water projects. Invasive species management is also a major emphasis in the Delta Plan. It's also relevant to the California Biodiversity Initiative. And also in the 2020 draft to water resources portfolio, there is a specific action to curb invasive species manage, curb invasive species that are altering California waterways. The action specifically calls for evaluation and improvement of weed management efforts. And I want to emphasize that we have an opportunity now to really implement this very action on the aquatic weed problem in the Delta. So importantly, some of the most recent science regarding control efforts for submerged weeds comes out of a study that was conducted under the umbrella of the Delta Small Reserve. This study was led by the Department of Water Resources and the State Parks uh, Control Program. It was funded largely by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And it tracked the effects of herbicide application at Decker Island and the North Delta site in 2017 and 2018. The herbicide tested was fluoridone, which you see pictured here. This is the only widely authorized herbicide for submerged weeds in the Delta. It's applied in a pelleted form, and it requires multiple weeks of experience of sustained exposure to be effective. This is an herbicide that has been successfully used in wake systems. So following its typical protocols for the State Parks Control Program, sites were treated two to three times for 12 to 16 consecutive weeks. This means that, treat, that each treatment site had the herbicide applied between 25 and 40 times. At the North Delta site, which was only a 140-acre plot, over 25,000 pounds of herbicide was applied over the course of 17 months. Despite the effort and the resources that went into treatment, there was no lasting change in weed coverage. We think that a major reason that there was no effect was that much of the herbicide was flushed off the treatment site quickly. So to provide a little more context on the control program for the Delta, Edward Hart from um, State Park is going to give us an overview of the program. Thank you, Elise. Next slide. <coughs> 
Department of Parks and Recreation is the only entity currently authorized to treat aquatic invasive plants in the Delta. It's a long standing program. It was first authorized to control water heights in 1982 under John Garrett's bill. And then in 2001 for Agaria Densa, which is primarily a diverse aquatic plant of concern. At the current level, the annual cost of this program in the Department of Parks and Recreation is $12.5 million. Approximately 70 to 95% is devoted uh, to submersed aquatic vegetation control uh, just for the control costs associated with addressing invasive aquatic plants. Again, this is primary for the purpose of Florida, uh, the same agents that are currently using or did use for the Brazilian strategy study. We are authorized to treat nine different invasive aquatic species and up to 15,000 acres per year based on our current biological opinion. Our current program recently committed, completed rather, the consultation process and has two new biological opinions from both the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fishery Service. It was a lengthy process requiring 26 months to gain all necessary authorization. We consulted with eight different agencies. The biological opinions are the ones that typically drive the permissions for the tools that we can use and where and when we can use them. Delta smelt, because of its historical habitat, covers the entire delta. It is primarily an important driver of these authorizations and the biological opinions. The new biological opinions authorize experimentation with new control tools, something called demonstration investigation zone. These new tools are physical and chemical approaches we have not yet used in our program, but hold with some promise better control outcomes in the future. <coughs> However, there are small sites, 10 to 20 acres, and there are significant restrictions on where and when they are allowed to occur. One third of our sites have major restrictions on treatment, including areas that are adjacent to the aforementioned restoration sites. Our program has been requested and now funded to treat vegetation at the fish restoration program site, which Dan Aorton has been talking about. Sure. Well, the fish restoration program is a series of plans and completed Title 11 restoration sites jointly managed by DWR and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. It was created to fulfill the 8,000 acre requirement of 2,000 acre biological opinions of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for Delta Smell. <clears throat> now, as Louise and Eddie highlighted, there is pressing evidence that current control tools uh, will not work in most restoration sites. Um, these same areas are also not committed to uh, new investigations. Um, and what I really just want to stress is that um, effective control of invasive weeds is the most important management action that we can take for our tile restoration plan. All right, uh, next slide. Thank you. So, based on these assessments of the control program and the expanding problem of submersive crop vegetation, we have identified two near term actions that need to adaptively manage the activity of the California mm -hmm. State Parks Weed Control Program. The first action is to prioritize regulatory authorization to try new tools at Decker Island and Prospect Island. These sites are part of the fish restoration program that are high risk of invasion from submersed aquatic vegetation, as we can see here on slide 10 map. Decker Island has already undergone construction and was a Delta Smelt Resilience Strategy site where Florida did not work, so there is a logical place to invest new tools. It is the southern site shown on the map here and persistent weeds are immediately adjacent to its breached levee. Prospect Island, on the other hand, is also a priority location with surrounding water rates already invaded. Development of effective control tools at these locations would be a specific implementation of the draft water resilience portfolio that Secretary Crookwood addressed earlier, which is an action to curb invasive species in our water rates. The second action we'd like to bring to your attention is that we need to identify funding for a consistent delta-wide monitoring program for aquatic weeds. Despite the importance of these plans, we actually don't have any consistent monitoring program. Only funding has only occurred opportunistically. So fortunately, we do have a framework. Uh, the Interagency Ecological Program has put some significant time into thinking about how you would go about having a landscape-scale monitoring program. So we have tools. 
um, know how to use them, but we don't have, there, there is no reliable support for the monitoring program. And this is necessary um, because if we want to be able to track regional trends and infestation, we need a landscape scale program. If we want to be able to evaluate new or existing control tools, we also need a monitoring program. For submerged weeds, this is, I want to acknowledge, very challenging because uh, typically the monitoring happens from the air. But you need to pair aerial monitoring with ground truthing in order to create accurate maps of submerged vegetation. And all of the data that you saw today in the maps and in the graphs was uh, based on that approach. So it is an investment. However, the payoff is that it will really be used to create a science-based control program to be adaptively managed year to year. So I want to leave the remaining time for questions and discussion. I, again, thank you for your attention. And specific members, any any ideas for getting to a place where we can uh, move on action one or action two? I think it was at the November DPIC meeting where Chuck Bonham said when we were talking about real time monitoring, um, more monitoring would be great, but we need to back it up with some funding. And I don't know <coughs> what your thoughts are on, on trying new tools at, at um, the recommended site. A, a, a possibility. Um, so I think we're focused on better, less on prospect, um, partly because um, we've got other restoration projects that we're moving into, some things that we're in out through in those areas. But I think on Decker, we could put a little bit more muscle into um, uh, the need to monitor, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the current funding of what kind of model? It's really opportunistic. Uh, there, the Stewardship Council intends to fund uh, 2020 mapping for submerged floating and emergent vegetation uh, for the primary delta. Um, after that, there is no plan. I think uh, going back to the graph that's on slide two or uh, I think uh, three, the timeline, time series, that one, those, all of those data points there were, were funded through a range of agencies, the uh, uh, Division of Boating and Waterways, uh, state parks and the department uh, funded the early years. And then California Department of Fish and Wildlife through the drought funded 2014 through I think 2016. And then DWR funded 2017 and 2018 and now 2019 is covered. Stewardship Council is picking up 2020. But beyond that, I really don't know of a plan. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those situations where um, a, a dire need that is being funded catches catch can. Uh, and I'm not sure. I, I think what we need to do is get an ideal situation for you. What, what would a consistently funded monitoring program look like? And um, what's the magnitude of funding over how long? I don't know, Karen, does the Biodiversity Initiative have any kind of call out for monitoring now? Not, not that I can remember on this specifically. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not a lot of money, and that means to go on now. So, um, I think you're getting at the. Uh, we recognize that there's a tough issue here and consistency over time. And coverage over a wide area is important. Mm -hmm. um, a number of things that we've tried to control this developing disaster haven't worked. So monitoring makes a lot of sense, but we've got to be doing things in the interim. Uh, and and one frustration that I've got is where, for instance, we jumped on and. and uh, 
Picard uh, and, and his group really pushed on the floating aquatic weeds. What we found out is that we did a better job of controlling them. We made room for not the floating vegetation that would wash out if we got a big winter or went <coughs> out to salt water where it would die, but what we created was the, the bed for a Gerodensa, which was being outcompeted by the hyacinth. So this is a really gnarly, complex problem that develops over time. So what would, who would take responsibility if we had adequate funding? Where's the best place to house this um, monitoring program? And what would it cost? Those questions that we're currently in a position to answer? Well, to address the monitoring program, I think for to complete uh, capture of imagery and do associated field monitoring and analyze the data, looking at somewhere between three and four hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, I think that is important to consider in the scale of the, the control effort that is currently at what, twelve and a half million dollars. So if that's helpful, there's a number for you. Um, uh, not only is that helpful, it's kind of astounding mm -hmm. that, it, that the number is that small for the leverage that it would give us in terms of trying new things, seeing what works, because one of the frustrations I think we've all got is that we don't yet know what works, and the regulatory process for trying anything new is years long. Well, can, I, can I ask, that is so modest. I'm a little bit incredulous, but out of the twelve and a half million dollar control program, why is it monitoring in it? I mean, when we do invasive tests, it all starts with delineation, mapping, knowing how far out we have to go or not. I'm just incredulous that it's not filled into the control program. I'm sure there must be some statutory reason or something. Well, so I may speak to the Secretary Rob. So there is a monitoring component the state water boards have monitoring as well as the NOAA and US Fish and Wildlife monitoring related to fish presence, water quality. But we've also coupled in our submerged aquatic vegetation program hydroacoustic monitoring, which tells us the density, which is similar to, I believe, pure operation for hydrilla in a survey, uh, that identifies the density and then through rake, very crude approach, just taking a rake and throwing it in the water, pulling it and identifying on that rake what species of, of FAB is on that. That is what we do for each reach. We have that data. But I think what is being addressed here back and forth is it's a we look at three things. It's tactical, it's operation, and it's strategic. And the four hundred thousand dollars may be a survey. What I need on the ground is a tactical and an operational approach. What can be operationalized to say if I've got hundred and one thousand acres of the delta that's authorized to control and I prioritize it on an annual basis, how do I ensure performance within confines of the delta? Stewardship Council's requirement is to be able to show. I put forth in my operations management plan, I want to do 5,000 acres in 2020. Well, come 2021, I better be able to show all of you that I made some dent in this. The best way to do that is also through the, the low rent, the hydroacoustic, but it's also through other entities that rely on this service, Division of Boarding Waterway Service, to provide the, the vegetation. Uh, public health, economy, and environment. To be able to see, did we make a gain in these three areas, whether it's food and fiber, whether it's uh, conveyance, or whether it's recreation? That's what my job is. But in order to show per performance, there's a varying layers of whether it's satellite, or whether it's just taking a boat, going over the site that you just treated, and tell me whether or not the cover of the vegetation has shown decrease. There's two different scales here by which we've been utilizing. I think what's on the discussion table here now is a much broader fixed wing aircraft or drone uh, system that looks over fast areas. Uh, that's a survey. And I think this is reflective of the slide that's in front of all of us now. But what we look at on a daily basis is tell me what each site looks at based on species composition. Is it getting better or getting worse in the relative sense of are we transitioning? from a native or a non-native circumstance to a native. Uh, 
So I have a question. So when you pick Decker and Prospect, um, is there a reason that those are the two sites you wanted to focus on? Or are there other sites that are in um, you know, this little window here where there's value to increase monitoring and um, testing with different tools? So Decker, if one reason to pick Decker mm -hmm. is that we already tried what we have. Yep. It didn't work. So the other reason to pick Decker is the site's already been constructed. So there's an urgent need. Yep. The third reason to pick Decker is it's not that big. Mm -hmm. It's on a pilot, it's naturally on a pilot scale that uh, that would work for something mm -hmm. like a physical control method that maybe the, the Division of Voting and Waterways hasn't tried yet, but it's a nice scale to start at. Mm -hmm. cut, your, cut the teeth of the program. Okay. So that's one. Um, prospect, if you want to speak to that. Yeah, just real quickly. The prospect is kind of unique. The northern portion, about 1,300 acres, is completely sealed off from the tide. So um, I can't speak to all the regulatory requirements that we face in there. But um, it's a pretty ideal canvas to, to try out some of these tools. Our other sites, as you guys probably know, um, we have 11 sites, four have been constructed. The other seven have not. The prospect is the only one that's really that we have where we can say it's completely sealed off. Some of them are dry, some of them are a little bit wet, but like I said, possibly. And it's something that we own, that, that BWR owns, um, holds, mm -hmm. where other sites are owned by outside contractors. Yeah. And I think also <coughs> in Prospect, you have this kind of comparison, in this case, between the enclosed section and the waterways outside of it, which also feed into the larger cash flow complex, which you were alluding to. You know, we'll look out to the Louisville Ranch, these really large scale projects. So action in that region, um, in those waterways, generally speaking, gives us really valuable insights into that, you know, huge 6,500 acres of restoration that's beneficial. Could I add one thing on the budget for the monitoring program? I just wanted to mention that I based that off of the proposal that we have received for 2020 monitoring, adding some for additional analyses. The other point I wanted to make off, um, on this is that trying to make the point here that this is an area where there is a shared interest. We talked a lot about that on the last agenda item. Uh, Ecosystem-based management is going to require some area where, where we can have, we, we can convene and have shared goals. And I think this is one of those areas. And one of the exciting things that's been going on in the area of aquatic vegetation science is that there's been increased collaboration among scientists. In the last 10 years or so, I can think of two major groups that uh, span multiple agencies. And one is the Delta Region Area Wide Aquatic Plant Weed Program, <laughs> DRAW. And uh, this is a federally funded initiative that, that looked at, that brought a lot of attention to issues for water hyacinths for, and how it related to mosquito control programs. Um, and is investing in modeling to look at nutrient management and how that may affect invasive weeds. Another area is the interagency ecological program. And with the Delta Small Resiliency Strategy Study, um, there was an initiation of a project work team for um, invasive aquatic vegetation. So these are areas where we're already getting scientists to collaborate and advance the field. And I think that there is an opportunity for management to leverage that momentum and come to a place where can listen to scientists and understand this is what we need and what we're saying is that we need more authorization to move forward and experiment with new tools. Because we have some foundation now that shows us for some virtues, we don't have an effective tool. And so that is an area of focus. And that if you can combine that with a monitoring program and attention to that and evaluating regular, eva regular evaluation of maps, you could, you already have a partnership between state parks, AWR, and other agencies to say, okay, we learned this. How do we apply that to on the Delta scale for a control program for next year? And what about the year after that? We're getting there. And I think it's an opportunity. So, um, unfortunately, we are running short on time. Um, Maria, so I was just going to say on the authorization side, I don't have a topic on the presentation, mm -hmm. but just to follow up afterwards if we have a request, I, I know we worked really hard with putting a waterway 20 years ago to try to get a multi year plan that has flexibility, so it wouldn't be to initiated. And I just want to thank you guys for.
for working for our church and gathering. I think it's great to see the agencies collaborating on this issue because it is one that clearly sort of fall, could otherwise fall between the cracks. So I'm happy to talk further about anything on the authorization side. Thank you. So that, as a follow-up item, we'll um, huddle and we'll work with each of the BPIC agencies to see what we can do to at least uh, get to uh, action one. Thank you. 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 Our wonderful Richard Falkenstein will be um, presenting on this item uh, follow up. And she, she is uh, here with Assistant Professor at the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Oregon State University, Kelly. Uh, anyway, thank you. Um, I'm going to make my introduction extremely brief. I just want to remind you all that um, at the November DTIC meeting, I briefly presented on the impetus behind the social science task force effort, the charge to the task force, and the process of, that the task force took to develop its recommendations report. And today, I'm happy to introduce Kelly mm -hmm. Edenway, um, assistant professor, and um, actually the first social scientist uh, hired in Oregon State um, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. And today she's going to present on a summary of the social science strategy that was developed by the task force. Okay. Um, she's going to the next slide. So um, I'm going to try to be really brief here because I know that we are all running up against meetings. Um, quick reminder of what social science is. There are many different disciplines and we all come at it from different ways. So psychology, economics, human geography, we all have different framings and different types of questions that we look at. And one of the main things to remember, though, is that within all of these fields is a subdiscipline of environment. Environmental psychology, environmental economics, environmental geography, and each of those people are specifically skilled at helping with environmental management. So we're not saying to go out and randomly look for social scientists, but to find those who have the skill sets to talk about aquatic invasive species or recreation or um, adaptive management or ecosystem-based management. Um, you can go ahead and the next slide. And for that reason, this is a task force that was um, engaged. You'll see that we represent several different types of social sciences um, in writing this report. I'm going to quickly cover um, the various deepest engagements that we've had over the last year or so for this project. So um, during the task force kickoff, kickoff meeting in January of 2019, seven of our ten presentations that day were from deepest agencies. This provided agencies and entities, um, this is needed, with an opportunity to inform task force members of their mission, key management challenges, and relevant initiatives and projects. So the task force can consider in writing the report and planning uh, additional events last year. And during the Delta Agency Science Work Group meeting, which was held in January of this year, staff from multiple DPIC agencies participated in a discussion of the task force's draft report, which was released in December of 2019. A summary of that discussion and the feedback on the draft was comprised, uh, uh, consolidated and provided to the task force for consideration in their final draft. Now Kelly will present the near final findings and recommendations from the task force. So I'll start with a couple of just takeaways in case we end up getting cut off at some point. Um, first of all, we are founding, the foundation of this entire report is that we are a couple of natural human systems. And what we mean by that is the ecosystem with which we are in is is how it is because of human decisions interacting with ecological processes. And if we don't all agree on that, then there's really no reason to read this report. Because that is absolutely the foundation for why you would even engage social science. Um, uh, you have no specific mandate here in California to do social science, as we do in the Puget Sound where I work. But that said, to be able to meet your goals of invasive species management and any of them, you need to understand the different values, the different behaviors, the different politics and power distributions that are actually um, in causing people to do what they do. Um, so the two big takeaways I want to say based on that are, um, one, wherever you have a biophysical scientist, you should probably have a social scientist because we are the other side of that equation. If it's a coupled system, then the other side of that system is what the human is doing and why the human is doing it. You don't see that completely. The second 
second takeaway is whenever we design research, when we design that research, it should have a social component and it should have an ecological component. It should be trying to understand the ecological interactions, but it should also be trying to understand the human components that are creating that situation to begin with, because that's why we're all doing restoration. So those are kind of big takeaways. We build um, those takeaways, we create three different findings. So this first finding here, finding one, is about building internal capacity. And in a way, that this builds um, very nicely off of the ecosystem-based management conversation we had earlier. They provided a five-step framework. We're basically going to give you those same five steps and say social science, social science, social science, social science, in all of those five steps, right? Um, and so, for example, uh, in this one, build internal capacity. How can you hire social scientists at different levels, not just internal? but people who can be at mid-level staff, people who can be at high-level staff, who understand human behavior, human values, and how we can study them systematically so that we're not relying on our biases to tell us why things are happening, is what we generally do, right? Um, the second, and, and having internal work groups that can um, continue to bridge the gap between what's happening internally in your agencies and what social scientists might be doing outside of the agency. The second one is building external capacity. That is the idea of making sure have social scientists on any advisory boards, or even facilitating um, social science advisory boards to contribute to the independent science board or any other actions that you have. And then the third is to actually invest in a broad array of social sciences. I hate to land on funding, and I'm not going to push that because the funding is always where this, the conversation ends up, and I don't think it needs to end up there, honestly. Um, when we talk, we just talked about having um, the workshop, the science workshop that you're going to have in April. There should be a lot of social scientists at that workshop, right? That should not not be. We just did um, one in the Puget Sound, and we had 20 social scientists at that workshop. That's a similar workshop in terms of prior terms of social, or prior to science. Um, <coughs> the next one. So the next one is thinking about framing and how we can uh, develop a conceptual framework that exists <coughs> over in a couple of natural systems. So when we identify that we have these biophysical factors that we care about, like water quality, water distribution, all of that, what are the human side of that? Is it because is it the human behaviors that are decreasing the quality, and or is it the human benefits that are obtained from the, that water quality? And by creating basically a, a visual framework that we all buy into and adopt, that can guide all of our research and hiring processes to meet that overall conceptual framework. The second step is to develop performance measures. EBM conversation here, but that you have performance measures of the social system that match that overarching conceptual framework that you are interested in. And then the third one is, um, and the important part about those two is that they need to be collaboratively developed. If Rachel sat down in her office and created performance measures and a conceptual model and presented it to you and said, this is what we're going to do, you probably would just walk away, right? And so this needs to be an effort that people actually agree is what we want to follow and what we want to pursue. Um, and then the third is how do we actually integrate social and ecological science? So like I said, whenever we're creating science, we should be thinking about the two sides of that question. Um, and so the idea is to actually, um, for example, if you're going to do water budget accounting, be thinking about what are the environmental justice issues, what are the economic issues, what are the social issues of that, not just the biophysical structures associated with that water budget and the ecological implications on that. And I can give you examples of um, people who have done that. Um, you can go to the last slide, or second to last slide. And then this last one helps recognize that social science has a couple of different roles in um, this whole process. One is providing science about <laughs> why things are happening, like uh, that can define how we should implement strategies and what kind of strategies we can. And the second is to evaluate whether or not what we're doing works. So there was a question asked earlier about why a prior water budget system didn't work, and there was an answer given. A policy analyst would actually systematically analyze that and be able to tell you why it didn't work. And it, there's, because there's an ecological and a social reason why it didn't work. And it's kind of like also. Um, there would definitely be an ecological reason, but there's also social reasons. And many of those are associated with cognitive biases and cultural factors that social scientists are really, really good at. We've been trained to um, analyze in a systematic way. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll leave those to where they are, and we'll go to the very last one. So this is just an image of adaptive management, which is in your mandate. And one of the things to recognize is that social science supports every single part of it. Social science will help you establish your goals and objectives because you do have social goals and objectives. 
Um, you, it'll help you model the linkages between those social objectives and how you can get your outcomes. It'll help you select actions that are actually going to potentially work because most of your actions are trying to change human behavior. And we have a lot of ideas because we're humans about how to change human behavior that are not scientifically derived. Um, and I, there's a lot of evidence for communication about how we actually create the brain effects when we do things not scientifically derived. Um, we, can, we will also help you evaluate um, why or why not the adaptive management cycle is even working from the social structure side of it. Um, and then go back to the home. Um, so I will actually leave it at that, and I doubt we even have time for questions. But uh, the report is, will be finished in um, mid-March, and we also recognize that this report is only one part of the product. Um, really, the important part is all the conversations we're having with the different agencies and the interactions that we can share some ideas about what we've seen and um, work in other places. Um, but the report, it will, I recommend you. Thank you very much. So, David members, I apologize for the meeting over. Um, we're three minutes over. Uh, <laughs> um, do you have questions for them? So, I'm really excited about this because I do a lot of thinking about risk management and helping DWR become a little bit more comfortable with that. And it's one of the things that we're thinking about a lot as we're working with the public about how do we manage the risk that's all around us. And to me, you know, especially in the Delta where we know we have some real vulnerability, particularly with sea level rise and change over time, I mm -hmm. see that as part of the way we start thinking about, um, you know, how we collectively um, make improvements um, across all the goals that we have for the Delta. So thank you. And so the question to contemplate until the next big tech meeting <laughs> is um, what can these big agencies do to implement the task force recommendations? And um, we'll see about having a follow up at the next big meeting, or at least a recording on some of the things that, that we could do. Thank you so much for coming all the way. Uh, Jeff, I, I, oh, sure. um, yeah, for, just very quickly, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to bring the attention to the February 5th letter on behalf of the Delta Protection Commission. It's a report of the draft report. It's called the final report, and we love what's in it. We want to be a party to the work that comes following the report, final report. We're going to want to be a resource. So, okay. um, I also just want to thank you guys. Because I know you travel down here. I really appreciate all the work that the task force has done. And I also mention that the Council on the Science Program is in uh, work with California Sea Grant. He actually has a position on now for a Sea Grant Extension Specialist, on, specifically on social science. Delta, that will be a small step. I tell you that we need more than a few people, but this will be a helpfully help, help to catalyze the letter. I'll start with one small <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Kim, for coming over the very um, So in closing, I would encourage everyone to please come to the Science Assessment Needs Workshop on April 27th, 28th. And with that, maybe